distinction for the heart is between, well, the distinction between human and animal and the way that he describes it is the idea of judgment and will. And to attain and develop these, knowledge should be attained through experiment and thought. So he puts it through the youth and the phases that we, that we go through, one being divine revelation, uh, ilham, ilahi, second being immediate disclosure or mubada, and third being the unveiling, being mukashafa, I think. And he describes that as the, the pace of this not being uniform and that ultimately, if you want to think about the attainment of knowledge and the ultimate, so utopia of attainment of knowledge, that's through the prophetic way of knowledge. And so if that's the, the ultimate, you can think of, of human beings, pace being or, or normal, normal human beings, pace of attainment of knowledge being very different. Um, Professor, I couldn't find really when you, when you when it spoke about describing the modes, I mean, apart from divine revelation and disclosure and unveiling, it's just talking about it. I I was just, I looked at the text more in the context of how much Allah allows you to and how much you endeavor or struggle to get to the pursuit of knowledge mm -hmm. across the three modes. But I didn't really find that much additional information on that. Okay, we will we will address that in, in our session. Okay, thank okay. you so much. And, and then and question the, uh, four, question and, and four was just, just about the first two questions. I will do yes. that in my in my uh, in my presentation uh, later on. Uh, continue, Khadija. Okay, question four was how does Ghazali view the relationship between the outer Zahi self and the inner uh, Baltian self? So the, what I saw was that the body is the the vehicle for the soul. And the soul is the seat of knowledge. So there's a tenuous link between the body and the outer and the manifest and the and the inner. And this relationship between the outer explicit and manifest and the inner is what we constantly on a journey to uncover. And so the outer self is required for the inner self, but mm -hmm. the inner self can only be accessed through the way of, of cleansing the heart, which ultimately he describes as a as a mirror to the essence of what it is to be human. But that point you just made that the that the the outer is the necessary uh, entry point into the inner that's 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 a critical point so that's great thank you you got that okay thank you very much uh huh Qasim Qasim okay. Um, maybe Qasim can hear us or something of that sort. Qasim, can people hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. And Qasim, Qasim should be able to unmute himself as well. In fact, but, he has. But I don't, I don't, I don't even think he can hear us. I don't think he can either because okay. there's no mic. There's no mic. Um, okay. Mic. Ibrahim. Yes. Um, well, let's I'm, continue. I'm wondering that, you know, the questions one and two, Jamia has also, um, you know, prepared that. So maybe we can go with Jamia and then Kasim might be able to. Uh, good, to good, good, good. Go, go Jamia. Bismillah. Uh, no, I, I prefer Ibrahim to tackle it. He's going to tackle it in his whole presentation. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 We don't want to make it this uh, onerous task to anybody. So that's yeah. fine. Uh, okay. Good. Okay, Bismillah. So um, let's come back to that. So can everybody see my screen? Can they see my screen? Yes, we can, Ibrahim. Okay, Bismillah. Yeah. So, so a couple of things that uh, I, I, I we need to talk today about um, the the book on on the uh, the commentary or the exposition on the uh, marvels of the heart. Um, is that Ghazali's, Ghazali's book, Yahya um, Ulum al-Din, um, is, uh, becomes available to us in, in, uh, in, four, uh, in four divisions. And, and the four divisions are that there are four parts to this Yahya Ulum al-Din, this meaning the resuscitation of the sciences of religion. Um, Ghazali, remember that he, after he left uh, Baghdad, he left his teaching post, he went into a deep inward journey 
into his soul and understanding what uh, he's doing in this world. And what he then did is that he decided that he's going to write this book, Ahea Ulumuddin, the resuscitation of the knowledge or the sciences of Dean, of, of uh, um, what we, we translate religion, but I don't like to use the word uh, religion for Dean because the idea of religion in the modern world means that something that is in the private realm. Um, and the idea of Dean historically in Muslim societies has always been that it is connected to life. But there are certain things that you are obliged to do. These are obediences. So the meaning of Dean is, into my mind, is obediences. And if you fulfill those obediences, you get salvation. At least that's a minimum uh, requirements uh, of your submission to, 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 to the creator in order to get your salvation. So the book is divided into four quarters. The first quarter is on uh, devotions, ibadat. And there he discusses the chapter on, uh, on ilm, on knowledge. Uh, he has a whole section on qawa'id uh, al-aqa'id, which is about doctrines, beliefs, and dogmas. And then he goes into the inner meanings of tahara, what is uh, ceremonial cleanliness. He deals with each of the major pillars. And he does a kind of an extensive discussion there um, on fasting, hajj, um, how to perform the recitation of the Quran, how to remember uh, God, uh, Kitabul Athkar, and Dawad, and how to do da uh, how to do dua, um, and and how to organize your 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 time for remembering God, and you and and organizing your time so you can optimize your day to develop the highest forms of spirituality. That is in the in the quarter that deals with the question of any deals with zakat and salah and all the pillars there. And then, yeah, so one of the things that I said to you on the last occasion we met is that he starts every section on the adab of, of salah, the adab of zakah, the adab of hajj. And the idea of adab is that is the proper way of doing it so that you can optimize, <clears throat> you can optimize uh, the spiritual growth that is required um, in such a uh, in such a spiritual path with such a practice in your daily practices and so on. And especially on your, so adab is very important. And adab is basically this ethical approach that he has. So he does quote the fiqh, he does quote the Quran, hadith and so on. But he's thinking about this, how do you internalize these, um, these various um, devotions, these practices you're doing, how does it have, how does it, it have and an effect on the heart and on the body and how does it generate an affect, a psychological state, okay? And then the second quarter is about what he calls uh, adat, uh, everyday practices that goes from everything from the adab of eating, the adab of marriage, the adab of how do you earn your income, um, the book dealing with uh, what is permissible and impermissible, um, how do you um, create uh, friendship and coexistence with different kinds of people? Uh, how do you do a certain amount of isolation? What are the, what are the adab uh, for travel? Um, how do you listen to music and you know, control or do uh, and perform during ecstasy? Um, the book on the commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Um, and uh, how to, uh, you know, Maisha, uh, uh, and also the akhlaq, the character of, of, of prophecy and the, on the prophet. And then the, the, the third quarter deals with the destructive vices. And uh, it starts, that, that, that quarter begins with the, um, the book on the, uh, an exposition on the marvels of the heart. It then goes on to the book on uh, the disciplining of the soul, the Riyadh to nafs uh, the book on the uh, calamities of the two major appetites, the appetite of the body, the appetites of sex and the sexual desire. And then the, the book on the, um, the vices of the tongue. Uh, what are the vices of anger? Um, 
uh, envy. Uh, then another book deal with you know how about the uh, about the uh, dunya when you you know reject the world or uh, blaming the world. <clears throat> how to think about you know the the harms that come from wealth and from being stingy um what are the negative things about people having arrogance uh and also uh all those issues are dealt with in in various ways in that in that book and the fourth one on the salvific practices on those things that will save you <clears throat> the things when you do is repentance to show patience and fortitude that you must always be balanced between uh, fear and hope. Uh, the book on on uh, on a certain of how to be abstaining in life and how to go with little. Um, the book and then there's another book there on the question of what is to have to hate uh, uh, through what is true belief in in God uh, and also to rely on God. Uh, the book on 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 uh, on love. Uh, but also uh, uh, a certain amount of uh, 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 how you satisfied uh, the book dealing with how to deal with your intention, truthfulness, and sincerity, uh, how to engage in meditation, and uh, and how to constantly remember, how to constantly think, and engage in in reflection, and how to remember uh, death. So much of it is covered in these in in these four books. That's how the the book of Ghazali is divided. Now, today we're going to discuss. Um, I found this very interesting. Uh, um, uh, what's the name? Uh, playfulness with the with my PowerPoint, so it generates these things for me. So you're going to deal with the heart, <clears throat> the spirit, or the ruh, the soul, the nafs. I don't know why why, why the computer generated a, a plant there for the nafs. I, I think it might be something more, but anyway, the intellect, the aql. So this is what we're going to talk about: the qalb, the ruh, the nafs, and the aql. That is what chapter one is all about. And Ghazali's main idea is that the heart is a subtle, tenuous substance of an ethereal, spiritual sort. Latifa ruhaniya rabbaniya. Now. This idea of a subtle, tenuous substance of an ethereal, spiritual sort. You're going to see that this term basically runs through almost in his discussion of the spirit, uh, the uh, discussion of the nafs, uh, and obviously when all of them come together. Uh, so uh, basically, sometimes people think that Ghazali is talking about four things. Uh, and he does give distinction. So in, in the Muslim tradition, when you say, you know, um, my heart hurts, your heart is a physical organ. But, you know, in historically, we've come to understand that the heart is related to something very special, something deep that identifies ourselves, our identity lies here. But what is our identity? Our identity might be something um, that is more than the physical body that we have. And what we, what we then think about is we think about the soul uh, and the spirit that is a special component of the soul and so on. So this, this, uh, the discussion of the heart, spirit, and soul, uh, discussion of the qalb, the ruh, and the nafs are very much interlinked. And we should sometimes think about very carefully what it is. Oftentimes, Ghazali and Muslim thinkers talk about the heart because they're talking about the pectoral cell. This area where your pectoral muscles are, that is almost seen as the kind of, you know, um, uh, the, the, the kind of main, you know, control box of the human being. Um, so you think with your heart, even though you use your brain to think, but the, the realization of what you know uh, comes into the heart. So we say, you know, I know it by heart. You know, when you memorize something, I know it by heart. Even though the brain plays a very, very important role in generating the memory and controlling the memory and how well it operates. But we say here, because the realization of what you know and its significance is generally understood that something more complex than just memory is involved. What other people might call consciousness, awareness, 
something deeply spiritual. And obviously the Muslim, Muslim thinkers are very hesitant to speak um, you know, in, in unambiguous terms of what exactly um, the spirit is, for instance. Uh, you know, uh, we say, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a Quran, it was, rabbi. they ask you about the, the spirit, say the spirit is a matter uh, that is exclusively to God. And some people are hesitant to talk about it. But Ghazali says, no, it is not necessary that you, that, that, that you must be completely silent about it. You can think and reflect about it because it's such an important part of it. Therefore, the discussion of the spirit, the ruh, is also a tenuous substance. But the key thing is that the ruh knows and perceives. This is the knowing component and the perception component that the ruh adds to the subtle tenuous substance. So the, the idea of knowing and perception is very critical. Even though the definition of the ruh, the spirit overlaps <clears throat> with one sense, one definition of the heart. <clears throat> of course, Ghazali says the heart is obviously that, that organ that you have in your, in, in, in your body. But he says, you know, man has a particular kind of, 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 of uh, a function that medical people can tell you better. But that is not what I'm talking about. He says, my, my concern is about the nature of the spiritual heart. And we call the heart a heart because the word qalb comes from the word, uh, qalb means to fluctuate. And the heart, the physical heart continues to beat and that we see it as a fluctuation. And therefore we also call revolution inqilab, when you turn things upside down, things fluctuate violently, we have revolution inqilab. Uh, okay, or right. And so the spirit coming back to the spirit the key thing that we say about the spirit is that it is, it is, it knows and perceives. Or as we say sometimes, I know it in my heart. But the other thing that Ghazali, when he talks about the heart, he thinks of the heart as a mirror, because the heart as being a mirror. Because if the heart is clean, what does it mean when the heart is clean? In other words, when later on he will discuss when the spirit and soul are under control and they are not corrupted. Um, when these spiritual dimensions of us are not corrupted or when they don't have rust on it or when they have been cleansed through certain kind of spiritual practices to self-discipline and so on, the mirror of the heart can reflect um, not only uh, discursive knowledge, knowledge that we know, but also received knowledge. And we can understand a knowledge in much more complex and deeper ways. And that's why we need to have uh, the ruh uh, in, in, a, in a optimal state all the time. Um, now, when it comes to the discussion of the soul, um, there are different meanings of, of the soul. Basically, the soul is because the ruh is such a subtle and very complex thing of which we don't know much, um, but we know it is there because once the spirit leaves the body, it seems that um, then perception and knowing disappears. Or sometimes we say, you know, we, we say the, the ruh has left the body, right? The spirit has left the body. Um, <clears throat> so, but even though the Quran sometimes says, ya ayatun nafs, the Quran uh, says, that we will take your nafs, we will take your soul. You must remember that there's overlapping understandings between the soul and the spirit. It's almost as if the soul is the kind of foundation to which the spirit uh, is in a, some kind of nexus. When the question arises from Muslim thinkers, how is the soul, sorry, how is the spirit related to the body? Um, they would say that it is not inside the body nor outside it. 
what it then means is that the spirit has a certain kind of nexus. And what exactly that nexus is of how that is, we don't have much understanding, except that we know what the effects are. Once that nexus between the body and the spirit is severed, there is no, there is no human being anymore, the, the way we know, knew that person. <clears throat> so the different meanings of the soul, they are negative and positive meanings. Um, so the negative meanings is that when the soul is in a bad state, we say, you know, sometimes in South Africa and elsewhere, you know, my nafs, the nafs, when say someone is envy, when someone is envious, they say so-and-so has nafs, you know, his envy, in other words, has a bad soul. That's what it means. Soul is in a negative condition. The soul is not really optimized. And therefore, um, the soul needs healing. <clears throat> But the soul is also has a positive sense. Nafs basically is the what we call a human being. That's the best way we understand a human being. We call it a nafs. Um, and that is our personhood is, is through our understanding of the soul, the nafs. There are different conditions of the soul. The ideal way that we want to depart this world is to have a peaceful soul. And that is what we strive for. And what we really want to avoid is the evil soul. In other words, it is such a soul that this soul takes no other commandment but the commandment of evil. It is so habituated to evil. <clears throat> and that's the soul we want to avoid. But the soul that most of us live with is the upbraiding and lamenting soul, and nafs al -lawama. In other words, that soul that allows us to constantly remind ourselves that I've done something wrong. I have I thought something bad. No, don't think that that soul with which we have a conversation all the time, the soul that upbraids us and basically uh, rebukes us when we did something wrong. <clears throat> that is what possibly we think about the question of, 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 of conscience, that soul that speaks to us. So it's the same soul. It basically means different states of the soul. And these states of the soul don't come automatically one has to work hard at creating a different moment uh, for the soul uh, to arrive at a different place. <clears throat> so we wish, and when we, uh, uh, for those of you in Cape Town and so on, uh, you know, and when, when you bury somebody and so on, there's all the time the invocation, which is a, a, a passage of the Quran that says, oh, oh peaceful soul, uh, return to your Lord, you know, uh, you are happy and your Lord is happy. That is the, that is the, the good wishes we have for the soul. Whether the soul left the world in that state, we always think good of the soul. We're always hoping that the person would have been that kind. We don't make judgments <clears throat> on, on people, uh, you know, in what condition they have left, but it's for every individual to strive with the soul to arrive at a better place. <clears throat> The next is the discussion of the intellect, the aql. And, um, and basically, um, knowledge of the, the real nature of things. Now, this discussion of the real nature of things is a difficult conversation in that, <clears throat> you know, we know what water is, H2O, right? Um, uh, you know, hydrogen and oxygen, and they're the mathematical proportion of it. So that's one thing to know it. <clears throat> but the real nature of things is more than just understanding the material uh, reality of things, but also to think about something beyond the material. What is the, the more deeper meaning of water to our, our existence or anything that we have? In other words, it's just not about things, but it's about 
a combination of things that gives us a certain kind of reality more than the sum of its parts, more than the sum of its parts. To have that kind of insight and wisdom is the knowledge of the real nature of things, the haq, to know the things, the haqiqa of things, just not to know the outside, the external, the exterior combination of things. <clears throat> and the intellect perceives knowledge. Or, and sometimes you also say the heart perceives. So the intellect is normally we saw the intellect to be here towards the head where the dimar, the brain is, but it also is connected to the heart because the heart has a certain kind of realization. So if you have those four combinations, you understand Ghazali's key working operations of what are the elements that he uses uh, 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 for that. But there is a fifth uh, thing, the first meaning of that. The corporeal heart and spirit, okay, and we now talked about the spiritual heart and spirit already. Then, he, then the appetite of soul, we talked about that when the soul, that is the nafs, is only addressing its appetites and not addressing and not fulfilling its higher meanings, then it's in a, if it's only addressing its appetites, it's in a bad shape. If it goes beyond the appetite and goes and reaches into the malakut in the angelic realms, in the higher realms of existence, then it's in a good space. And if intelligence is utilized, gives rise to a fifth meaning. And that fifth meaning is again, that subtle substance in humans that knows and perceives. So this almost, uh, you know, in some ways relates, where did we talk about knows and perceives? We talked about it here, about the spirit, knows and perceives, right? Um, so what, what is happening is that it is the realization of all the subtle dimensions of the 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 ruh, the spirit that 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 is the culmination of all that and when they function as an interconnected network the heart the spirit the soul and intellect they give rise to let's say it gives rise to a network so this fifth thing is a network and that network is something that we always like to keep in optimal in optimal condition and that's what Ghazali says that that's how we need to make sure that these various components are well oiled, they are well served, and they are well trained. Then chapter two is basically a deep commentary on one on one element of Surah Al Muddathir, <clears throat> and no one knows the forces of your Lord but God. Um, and so this, this chapter is basically a commentary on an element of this verse. Just this, because Ghazali want to talk about forces. Junoodu Rabbika. Hmm? <clears throat> so there are a couple of things in, in this, in this uh, passage that we need to focus on. And if I forget, you need to remind me. One is on this idea, it appears twice, God um, leads astray whom God wills and guides whom God wills. But the passage that Ghazali focuses on وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُوَ And so the verse is a, 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 a long verse, and we have made only angels, commanders of hell. So, but Ghazali, so then you understand why he's playing on this concept of an army, battalions. And we have made only angels, commanders of hell. We have, have only made their number a trial for those who scoffed. <clears throat> So to those whom scripture was given may become certain and those who believe may increase in faith. Oh, 
of what starts happening here. <clears throat> And those given scripture and, and, and believers may have no misgivings. And so those with sickness in their heart and the scoffers may say, what does God intend by this example? And uh, does God leaves, and leaves anyone astray at will and guides anyone at will? And no one knows the forces of your Lord but Allah. And this is but a reminder to humanity. Now, what Ghazali is, is saying here is that God has armies at work and these armies are at your disposal with whom, if you want to, you can become friendly with this, these armies. And who are these? Who are these soldiers? Who are these soldiers? That's the, the question that hopefully some of you will think about. But every army must have a commander in charge or a chief of a kind. And the commander is the heart and the heart has visible and invisible armies. So uh, when Khadija said that, you know, you have these external uh, dimensions to the body, the visible armies, the ear, eye, tongue, hands, feet, they listen to the heart when the heart tells them do the right thing, or when the heart is not in a good condition, they do the wrong things. And, uh, and they operate like angels in the same way that angels obey God without any question. Similarly, um, ideally our various um, physical organs ought to obey the heart if the heart is in a, um, uh, if the heart is in a good condition. And we know that the angels obey God because the verse of the Quran says the angels do as God tells them to do. And uh, the vehicle of the heart, and when we use the word heart here, we're talking about a heart that has in it the soul, which is the ruh, and, sorry, uh, the spirit and the soul. Okay, so the heart is a, 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 a very important, the word in itself is just not the heart, but the heart as the seat of this network that I talked about earlier. And the vehicle of the heart is the body <clears throat> and the provision of food of the heart is knowledge. And the army moves through stages and each stage accomplishes certain things. The heart has two armies, as I said, Uh, first army are the limbs, and therefore, you cannot reach Allah but through this body that you have and through this world in which you live. And therefore, care for the body is vital. I'm just advertising for Dr. Rafiq Khan here. Care for the body. And for all doctors, they care for the body. Um, um, that the care is vital because without this body, you cannot do the things that you want to do. Um, and the second army is the army that provides the, the invisible army that provides food on the interior, what we normally call, you know, food for the soul. And so Ghazali thinks about these as armies, or I use battalions, military language, divisions, or regiments of the, of the army, um, because these are all kind of subdivisions. What is the idea of the army? The army operates in lockstep. They have serious discipline, right? They are very, very disciplined. So this is all about disciplining. So the first battalion, he, the way he explains it, recruits and repels. It recruits and consolidates that which is good, positive, and suitable, like appetite or desire. So here's the thing, this idea of shahwa, appetite of desire, can go both ways. It can be go both good or bad, depending how you utilize it. I cannot, I cannot wake up for suhoor or stay up after fajr and prepare my slides if I don't have an appetite or desire within me, which is natural to me. I could have gone the other way and go and sleep and not have a set of slides or not have 
done my work uh, correctly or uh, optimized my, my preparation. That is when I acted to my shahwa. But the shahwa is that desire. It is natural to us. It depends how we discipline, how we recruit our shahwa. So shahwa in and of itself is not a bad thing. In other words, appetite or desire or what the book, uh, textbook calls appetence, right, is not a bad thing. Without an appetite for learning, you won't be here on this call. Um, um, or, uh, you know, without an appetite at 9.15, which is way too late, I mean, which is beyond, uh, you know, if that time, I'll be starving, okay? So if no one had the appetite to do things, uh, you will not be doing the things that you do. I think it's quite clear, it's quite self-evident. Shahua is central to us as human beings. Uh, it must, the key thing is, it must not go out of control. And, and it, the shahua can also help us to repel negative forces like anger, because anger makes everything go out of control. So therefore, we always try to, to recruit the appetite to the good side so that that appetite, that capacity that you now develop by recruiting it, so you can repel your anger. So that when you when you are angry and, and you have a, a certain um, uh, state uh, of, 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 of anger, something helps you to take control of that. Okay. The second battalion is the battalion that, that mobilizes the body parts. Um, um, they mobilize the body parts to pick up, listen to things, to pick up things, to listen to things, to, ex to execute the tasks. And let us call this battalion the power battalion, the qudra, the power, capacity. And the third battalion, Ghazali says, does the intelligence work, uh, collects information, works like spies, and you use the power of smell, hearing, sight, and taste among the various body parts to accumulate information. That is how you build up knowledge and perception. So you use your senses, right? The, the, the usage of your senses. And um, I don't know, I think somebody's uh, iPhone is scratching on my slides. I don't know how that is happening. Maybe, maybe this is just what the computer is doing. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, Ghazali has, do you people all see the, the lines on the, on, on, on the slide? I don't yeah. know. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I don't know how that is happening. Um, Ghazali has uh, someone by name of Shahzad's uh, thing came up. So I don't know. The other one. Uh, if you can check Jamia, Jamia and, and to not make people share. Um, okay. So, or maybe this is just a, a, a kind of a aesthetic thing that my computer generates. I don't know. Um, no, it is a it is a glitch. Um, okay, um, okay, okay. Don't, don't don't worry. Don't worry about that. It's a glitch. So you know, we just talked about spies. So uh, yeah. So someone is spying. It's a good thing. Let them spy. They they can get something good out of this. So Ghazali has much to say about the last battalion, the, the one that does that. It collects information and generates knowledge. Hmm? They do important work on the inside of us. Um, things that happen in the brain and in the heart and in the soul. And when we get an image of a thing when we see things, and then we keep that in our, in our, in our memory, in our imagination called khayal, in our retentive imagination. And because we can then retain these things, we can then also recall these things. And therefore, he says that, um, and because of this, preceding memory that we have about things that we have acquired, we can then utilize our common sense, which is known as his mushtarak. We can use imagination, reflection, recollection, tahayul, <clears throat> tafakkur, and tadakkur, and that makes us kind of do the work of knowledge and perception with greater refinement and with greater complexity. So the his mushtarak are basically our senses, our five senses that operate together, 
when you say someone has common sense, don't you have common sense? In other words, can't you uh, hear, see, or, or you know, uh, or do something uh, much more? Uh, you, you can use your senses um, uh, constructively. That's what we say. Mm. And but in addition to that, there are there's also the the place of the imagination, reflection, recollection. And we have two homes: um, the nearer home, which is the dunya, and the next home, which is the akhirah, which is quite 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 quite, quite self-evident uh, from everything that you might have read. Now, um, Ghazali could have used the word drives and impulses, but he used a common word here when he just used the word armies, you know, um, or uh, army, a word that everybody understands. Um, and in order to create peace in our heart, we need to have um, certain kind of armies that one kind of army that does the work mostly and gives us peace and therefore he creates the idea of the Hezbollah and the Hezbollah Shaitan, the army of God versus the army of, of Satan and um, if the uh, desire and anger are, are perfectly obedient to um, what the intellect tells it um, then it is it, everything is good if our desire and shahwa and ghadab is out of control, we have a disaster on hand. And uh, the way we, we conquer Satan's army is to give the army of knowledge, wisdom, and reflection that is basically keeping this desire and anger under control. Then we acquire ilm, hikmah, tafakkur, and we give those things priority and keep these elements in the driving seat, so to speak. And then we will have a heart that is have mutmain, nafsun uh, mutmainna. Uh, we have a peaceful uh, state of the of, of the of the soul. Uh, and so Ghazali then reminds us, you know, of this amazing verse: "Waliman khafa maqama rabbihi." Hmm? And for those who, who dreadedly stand before their Lord and restrain the self from caprice. So caprice is, you know, it means when, when anything just goes, that is called caprice, when anything just goes. But hawa, like shahwa, hawa is also translated as desire. But when it is uncontrolled, we translate it as caprice, but in Arabic, you use it both ways. Like shahwa, without desire, you can't do anything, right? But what, what we should not let desire do is let desire go out of control. Hmm? Um, one should show restraint and think of the, and therefore we are reminded to think of the, 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 um, the status, the maqam of the Rabb. Maqam of the Rabb. Um, and that status of God in our lives, who is the creator of the cosmos, uh, uh, the cosmos of billions of years. And when we stand in front of Allah in our meditations, our prayers, in our life as such, it should drive us to a certain sense of humility. Um, the key terms that Ghazali uses is um, in chapter four are elm, knowledge, irada, will, appetite, anger, inner and external senses. Aha. So one of the things that I, 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 I omitted to tell you is this year, um, this verse of the Quran. Yes. Okay. So he uses the metaphor of the army, but God leaves anyone astray at will and guides anyone at will. This question at will, and most people get confused by that, is it Mashiach, the Mashiachullah. Um, we say, Insha'Allah, right? Insha'Allah. This is again the invocation of the will of God. I will do this Insha'Allah. So this will, Nothing, so the, the, here's the explanation. Nothing in this world can operate without God's will allowing for it to happen. 
Nothing can happen without God's will. So that's what we need to understand that nature and everything that functions that we sometimes think it operates according to certain laws and so on. That is the Mashiatullah at work. Disease, disaster, good things, bad things, everything that happens is the will of God at work. Whether you want to now say it's the silent nature operating silently or whether you think that nature is operating actively, depends on your philosophical understanding of that, but that is the will. But what God wants for you, what God, what God's, uh, you know, um, uh, what God, you read Allah bikum al yusr wa la you read what God really wants for you. That is, God always wants good for you. God always wants wants for you to have khaira, okay, and wholesomeness. So one of the things that is very confusing for people is that why did this happen to me? This happened to me, a bad thing, whatever, is Mashiatullah. It's the will of God. You cannot, that is just the way the world operates. But what does God want for me? God only wants good for me. And when something bad happens to me, then I'm in a, I'm in a kind of spiritual quandary and I'm then asking the questions about what is God's justice? Asking why did God give me this, you know, this calamity, this disaster, this suffering and so on. That is what we call theodicy, concerns about God's justice. How is God's justice, you know, uh, divided? We here in America think a lot about God's justice in different parts of the world people think about. I mean, we think about black Americans today of how Black Americans continuously get killed and shot by the police and by the, by the political system and so on and so forth. The question of theodicy and my friend Sherman Jackson, Abdul Hakim Sherman Jackson wrote a book on black suffering. Try and explain how do you make sense of the suffering? And obviously that's the, the, a moment of theodicy, understanding what is God's justice. That God's justice is then related to you personally as an individual, as a community. And then you have to work yourself to make sense of that. You try to make sense of that. What does it mean to me? What is, what is God trying to tell, tell me? What is, what, is, what is the purpose of my suffering? What is the purpose of my good fortune? Huh? It's not only suffering, but when you have good fortune, when you, when you, when you, when you so-called you know, have great wealth, or as we would say, you, you hit the jackpot, when you have great affluence, what does that mean? You know, sometimes it's only in poverty that we ask, you know, why am I suffering? But those who have wealth, those who have affluence should also ask the question, what is this gift to me? How do I use this optimally? So understand the difference between the will of God, the Mashiatullah and the Iradatullah. And that's the point that I wanted to make. And we can now move forward uh, to, uh, to the next section. Okay, so the key terms are ilm, knowledge, irada, will. Um, but you see the word, the word irada, can also sometimes play the, uh, the role of in the meaning of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Mashiach or Masha'a, but otherwise, you read Allahu bikum al yusr that should be your guiding voice that God wills. That is the because in the Arabic language, you can, word the, you can use the word irada uh, in the same meaning that you can use, uh, you know, uh, sha'a, yashi'u, yeah? yasha'u. Hmm? Uh, so you have to be very careful in what way is the word irada used? But I try to give you uh, the simple explanation. Now, ilm is to know the true reality of things, things you can see and things you cannot see. And, and we have to realize that there are things that are beyond sense perception of humans. And therefore, uh, we are also encouraged to make inquiry. Um, uh, we do not know that the earth is spherical, but when we do research, um, and inquire, we come to know that the earth is spherical. We do not know how water is formed when we drink it. Uh, we do not know all its kind of chemical properties, but we make inquiries. Similarly, the world of the soul is not that obvious. Um, and therefore you require, um, require proper knowledge. Shahzad, whoever you are, can you just make sure that your phone doesn't, doesn't, doesn't connect to this? Or is someone playing around with Shahzad's phone? 
It calls it something people give their phones to kids and they play around with it. And I don't know how this is happening, but anyway. Uh, okay. Um, will Irada. Um, when, we, when we have something in mind, we find the best way to do it. That is now our will with related to human beings, our will. Um, when we think of, uh, of something, we find within ourselves a drive or motivation, how to do this in the best way and how we are going to attain an end. And this way, our will is different from that of animals. So I'm talking about human will now, okay? And so, you know, we take the obvious steps what things look advantageous. Um, so Ghazali gives the example, for instance, of the idea of cupping. I, I'm not recommending cupping. Um, that is a medicinal practice of a different time and I'm very cold. But Ghazali gives this example. And um, you, know, you go for cupping, he says, um, you know, you, you do undergo some amount of discomfort, but you know that it is something that will give you, give you uh, uh, on the surface of it, it might not look ad advantageous, um, uh, and 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 but still you undertake cupping, which is a medicinal treatment in this time. Or in our day, for instance, we know that after a certain kind of operation, it will be a long recovery time, and there will be a lot of pain and difficulty. But we make a decision that we are going to opt for the op we you know we're going to opt for the operation, and it's in our best interest to do so. Um, so when we exercise our will, we exercise our decision, it is it's an informed one and it will be an intelligible one. And therefore, the doctor who's going to advise you is going to tell you a lot of hidden things that you don't know on the surface of it. I'm going to tell you about the recovery, what they're going to find on the inside of you when once they go in to do the operation, what the chances are that you might not survive or what the disadvantage was, all things that on the surface of it, you don't know what it is. But this information that we're giving comes from non-obvious um, uh, sources that, is, that requires learning, requires uh, inquiry. And that's what Ghazali says, that in all walks of life, not only in the physical world, but also in the spiritual world, you need to engage in deep thinking. And you must remember that Ghazali often applies the deep thinking that he does in terms of his philosophy and the deep thinking that he does in terms of of his uh, metaphysics and thinking that he, about the world, he also then turns it inward of how one can uh, utilize those skills about also developing your inner self, the inner self. So the same kind of skill is required to understand your moods, to understand your spiritual state, to understand a dream that you might have had, to understand the different possibilities, uh, uh, different states that you find yourself in, that sometimes you are deeply melancholic, sometimes you're deeply happy, sometimes you, uh, you know, very, very spiritually oriented, and sometimes you are not. You need to utilize all that. You require skill. Um, and Ghazali gives the example, for instance, someone wants to be a writer, but you have to acquire the skills. Similarly, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, when the human heart, and here by that he means, again, he uses the heart, but he means by that when the soul has the proper combination of knowledge and will, it will be different from that of, of, of animals. And that's how human beings differ from animals. <clears throat> Appetite, anger, inner and external senses all exist in humans, but in two stages. Stage one, that you must comprehend knowledge of first principles. So you need to do the, you know, the imp impossibility of impossible things, that you cannot be in Cape Town and Johannesburg at the same time, you can't be in New York and in Mecca at the same time, you can't say that one is larger than three. You need to have that clearly sorted out in your mind. <clears throat> Just because you know what a pen and an inkstand is doesn't mean you're a writer. Um, Okay, you need to, yes, once you acquire the skills, you'll know how to use the ink, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the pen and the inkstand and cursive writing, then you become a writer. Uh, or how you, today we will talk about how to get computer skills and so on. Uh, stage two, that we acquire uh, knowledge through experiment and thought, and we develop talents and skills in the same way what are we doing in the month of Ramadan? We're developing a certain kind of talent and ability to 
control our appetite, control our anger. These are skills that we developed from early childhood when we started, uh, uh, learn, uh, we started learning how to fast. Hmm? Now it almost becomes naturally, we sometimes also look forward to that. We can also do it outside of Ramadan. Uh, and therefore, different kinds of expertise and variety of knowledge, and Ghazali is here making a case for the various kinds of practices that take place in Tasawwuf, in Islamic spirituality, that you have to spend hours of meditation, you have to do something, do certain exercises, you sometimes have to undertake certain tasks that might not be tasks that other people undertake because you want to achieve a, a certain goal and reach a certain uh, destination in your spiritual journey. Um, um, okay. So the degrees of how we can advance in knowledge are unlimited. And when you build a relationship with Allah, you then gain special knowledge. And Ghazali believes uh, truly that Allah puts knowledge into your heart or the knowledge that you have develops a certain dimension. Let's call it the dimension that is not a dimension that everybody can see. And that comes with a, when you improve the quality of your relationship with Allah and you have you become, you know, close in the relationship with Allah. And then he also cites the verse of the Quran, ma, ma, ma linasi min rahmatin fala uh, that, you know, there, there is, um, when Allah opens up the door of mercy to people, no one can withdraw that. And um, if we, uh, so that is quite clear that knowledge must be, um, must be utilized and also there's another dimension of knowledge that arises you already know that the body is the vehicle for the soul um, if you you make use of your limbs optimally you can come close to the angels and you begin to enjoy the presence of the divine uh, but if you follow only your bodily pleasures you end up being a beast and the perfection of humans results in happiness and worthiness to live near the divine majesty. In other words, that you want to live near the divine light. You want Allah's torch to shine on you. And that is true happiness. But the distinguishing character of a human being is, as Ali says, marifa, experiential knowledge of the real and true things. And that happens when the light of knowledge is not veiled from the human heart. So one is to acquire knowledge, but the other is to wish and hope that the light of knowledge is not veiled from your heart. In other words, that knowledge reaches right into your being, into your soul. That's what I said earlier, that dimension, when you accumulate all the knowledge, stuff, you know, but what's that extra dimension that it generates? Um, and what makes us different from beasts is that we are, have wisdom and knowledge. And Ghazali makes a very strong case that the only worthy knowledge is knowledge of God, God's attributes, and, and, and God's acts in the world, God's deeds. That for him is the only thing that's worthy. Now, this might be a little bit controversial. And Ghazali makes such a big distinction between, you know, knowledge of what he calls ulum um, al-din uh, and, and al-ulum al-dunyawiyah. Uh, knowledge of the deen and knowledge of, of the world. Um, and that might be something that, that we can have a conversation on uh, at a later time. But for him, that's the most important thing because that makes all the difference. Okay, so let me, let me, let me stop here. And because we are, we are onto our times, uh, onto time and we need a couple of minutes for, for questions and so on. And I will come back to this in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, so. Uh, let's stop there and uh, just have a, a, a couple of minutes of, of discussion if uh, people want to have a discussion.
Uh, Ibrahim, perhaps people can use the the chat to indicate with Yes, you, you can use the chat uh, oh, if you have and icon. Mm -hmm. Ibrahim, stop sharing your your uh, PowerPoint as well, so we can see you. Okay. Oh, you couldn't see me throughout. Oh, I'm sorry about that. We can see you. We can see oh. you better. Oh, okay, good, good. Uh, let me uh, just pull up some. Thank you, Ibrahim. Very, very, very useful. I'm. I must say, even myself, I'm not in any way, but I, I'm. You know, it's not bedtime reading Ghazali. You've got to really. Um, um, go over it again and again. I've been enjoying doing uh, lo looking at the Arabic also. Mm -hmm. but it's complex to get your head around it. So uh, mm -hmm. quite a yes. lot of patience and hard work. Yes, it, it, it is hard work. Yeah. No, no, I mean, I mean once, you, once you understand this, you will not go to bed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they, therefore, the people who really get this, um, they, 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 they want to stay in this light, you know. Um. So I, I, I'm challenged by Ghazali because he says people of weak intellect, you know, they can't understand this stuff. So I have to give lots of amtila and examples. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it applies primarily to, prim he wrote it for me, for that line is for me primarily. I don't <laughs> understand. <laughs> Um, Ibrahim, I see Kasim is on now. Um, uh, uh, maybe we okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Good. Uh, that's fine. Uh, Shireen doesn't have to worry. Uh, 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 and uh, okay. And let me see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh -huh. I see Jamia has constantly given some notes here and so on. Uh, Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> I see Dr. Farid Isak is also here. Uh, and he said he'll be a more prepared student next week. Uh, I, but he wrote that only to me. Uh, good to hear. And uh, so is the distinction Ghazali makes between rules for enough? Okay, uh -huh. Okay, I'm, I'm really ha happy that uh, you've been providing uh, running commentary and, and uh, for people, uh, Sasa Jamia, so that's very good. Okay, um, so is it so certain that souls, when they come into existence, have negative tendencies beyond the control of the person? If so, how could this impact on a person's ability to recruit the armies of the heart and ultimately that person's accountable? Aha. Uh -huh. No, you see, one of the things that uh, the question is, Shana Seria, um, when the souls, when they come into existence, have negative, the, the Islamic understanding is that uh, the the human being uh, and the soul is comes in a state of of of, of fitra and where you are neither inclined to evil nor bad but in this complete state of neutrality it is the your, the way that you condition yourself in the world the way you act and perform in the world that will generate the kind of negative tendencies um so how would this impact on the person but even so let's just say you have negative tendencies how would one then be able to recruit the, the armies of the heart and ultimately that's a person's, person's accountability as your question is there? Well, one way uh, 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 of doing this is that Ghazali would encourage that you need to come into the presence of good people. First, get into a good environment. Um, hang out, as they say, with, with people of character, um, go into environments where your negative tendencies um, will not be challenged. Uh, sorry, uh, where, where your negative tendencies will not be uh, 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 promoted. Uh, go to a mosque, uh, get good friends. Um, then you'll be able to see that you're no longer feeding those negative qualities, and uh, and um, uh, and then you'll be able to begin to recruit the armies to do the right thing uh, for you. Hey, Brian, I think, I, 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 are we still getting Kasim to do his little... Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Can you um, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Carry on. Carry on, okay. Kasim. Um, I had to look at question five and number six. It says that you were something up earlier, so I joined the like. But uh, Ibrahim kind of covered all of... Uh, 
my material, except that I just wanted to mention some things that uh, resonated with me. And that was the, the, you know, the encouragement by Ghazali to encourage uh, free thinking, exper you know, experimental thought on the level of where you talk of like theoretical physics or, or you know, uh, beyond what is actually known, encourage uh, um, that kind of uh, thinking. And uh, in fact, I think the words he uses that it, it must be limitless, you know, following that uh, tendency. And if you look at today, if you look at um, uh, uh, where people are making, you know, the cutting edge stuff, you mentioned some of this last week. Um, if you look at the very big and the very small, then um, we are looking at uh, stuff today that's being reviewed slowly, slowly with regard to quantum theory. We're looking at fractals and particles and stuff. You know, they talk, talk about um, God particles and now they're getting smaller to a beauty particle that only exists for an instant where they can measure it in these accelerators that are in Europe and stuff. And, um, you know, those things are being revealed slowly, slowly. And if you look at, at even the way um, his reference to the prophet and the prophets, the revelations actually came slowly, slowly to them also, because when Nabi Musa was uh, spoken to by God, um, you know, Allah told him that there's still 700 or 1,000 veils in front of you, even though you're speaking to me today. You know, that must still, there's still things that are going to be revealed. And though these, you know, uh, we like to look at, you know, uh, um, you know absolutes. And, and when I teach at school, it's difficult for the children to understand that there are actually gradations of things. Similarly, with, and I know I'm trading on the way out here, yeah, but even with like revelation, they are uh, gradation. And it ended with the ultimate example of the Prophet, uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his example and his understanding was total because he was, he got to, uh, through his Mi'raj, he got to the, the, you know, seventh heavens and was um, exposed to all of that. So this thing about, um, you know, when we come to knowledge, I think Ghazali kind of makes, um, knowledge and the pursuit of it, you know, in and of itself is, 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 is important and um, uh, significant and something to pursue. And uh, I like, you know, the, 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 the free thinking thing of uh, the thing, because like we said last week also, there's very few independent thinkers that are going around. And I think we're sitting in the company of one of them today. Um, I'm amazed and I, 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 you know, I'm not, you know, one must give praise where praise is due, but I also, for me, this is completely new, but I'm enjoying it so much, partly because I have time to read and read and reread. And um, I had a little, you know, uh, sort of informal talk with both Jamia and Imam Rati. Uh -huh. We chatted about this thing. So, um, it's, it's, it's for me, it, it is, it is, um, it is, it has been a very nice experience so far. Shukran, and, uh, Shukran I Qasim. Think all of these, um, you know, the terminology, I even went to other translations that um, uh, this guy never used in his book. Um, there's this one from, from Khan that is now sort of very popular in Cape Town. I don't know, it's not uh, Rafiq Khan. <laughs> Some other guy in, in Mumbai, and uh, uh, it, it's written in sort of ordinary language, and I, I, I love the translations because it goes beyond what um, uh, uh, um, uh, Kelly. Kelly is. is yeah. Okay, Shukran, so Shukran, 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 Shukran Qasim. Shukran Qasim, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have a couple of more questioners, uh, Sister Jamia. Yeah, and we, we, we've only got a few minutes left, but Yasin uh, Muhammad has had his hand up for a while, if he's still there. Um, Dr. Yasin Muhammad, do you want to ask a question? Assalamu alaikum. Um, this is Nabil Yasin Muhammad. Uh, okay. Yes, I saw oh, yeah, Nabil, Nabil, but yeah. Okay, good. Assalamu alaikum. Um, shukran so much for your presentation. Um, my question is, um, so in Ghazali's um, Kitab Sharh, Al Ajayb Al Qal, um, he, he mentions two forms of acquiring knowledge or the Haqqaiq Al Ashia. 
-hmm. on the one hand, it's abstraction or induction, or what we know as another or philosophical mm -hmm. demonstration. And on the other hand, he seems to emphasize um, knowledge through Mukashafa. Um, in your opinion, what would you regard as in a, in when you look at Ghazali's entire corpus, what do you see him emphasizing as the superior means of coming to know the Hakoi Kalashia? Thank you. So Ghazali obviously has a um, is is a is a strong advocate of knowing that knowledge of unveiling. Elmul Mukashafa, which is knowledge of unveiling, divine unveiling uh, that he does believe is possible. Now, in his Ihya Ulum Din, he sometimes veers off and shares some things about a story of a saint and the saint's insights, a wali Allah or a, a insight from the prophet that might be at that level uh, of, of ilmul, uh, un mystical unveiling, then he quickly stops himself and he says, well, you know, this book is about uh, ilmul mu'amala. These, this book is about telling you, this, you know, teaching you about things that are matters of transactions that are kind of um, ethical moral practices that doesn't require, you know, that kind of deep background knowledge. But he himself uh, does say that at the end of the day, with all his doubt and all his uncertainty, and last week we talked a great deal uh, about that. And for those of you who were not here last week, I believe the, the talk is recorded. You can go back to it. He says that ultimately for me, certainty was not in the question of what, what theology or philosophy or, uh, uh, or uh, fiqh gave me certainty. I couldn't find it there, but I found it from the people of people of spirituality, uh, the Ahlul Haq, uh, the people who truly understand uh, the truth. And when God cast his light into my heart, and then he does believe that God gave him a certain kind of, 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 of uh, solace, and he found certainty um, uh, in God um, through that unveiling so that is a kind of a mystical unveiling or a hint and he does believe that that is valid um, but he doesn't talk great, a great deal about that in the Ahya Ulumuddin there are other places that he would hint at that and talk about these kinds of events uh, that occurred in the lives of the of, of the hukama or the salihun and then he would uh, he, but he does uh, he does approve it and he does believe that but it should not go contrary to the rules of the sharia so Faisal Ghazali ended up in, 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 in a lot of trouble. Um, so for instance, there was this person who was suffering of a great deal of the disease of arrogance. So somehow he was advised by his spiritual master, go to the bathhouse. Where people in the olden days, people go to the bathhouse, go to the bathhouse. What do you do? So people leave their clothes one side, then they go into the go put on other people's clothes, do it slowly and walk out so people can detect you. And then people will start hitting you and attacking you and say, you're a thief, you're a thief. And they beat you up. Uh, and that will be a great humiliation for you. Of course, Ibn al um, uh, started as absolutely horrified at this. How can Ghazali Quote this example, for instance, when this man is, is encouraging people to engage in theft. Um, but the, the idea of the Sufi master was not that, was able to subject him to some kind of humiliation and kind of physical humiliation. So people had, you know, a different, a different understandings of, 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 of this practice of Ghazali and, and, and he came under some criticism for, for violating the rules of the Sharia. Whereas normally he himself would say that you have to stay within the bounds of Sharia. But he thought, maybe he thought of this as not the real stealing, but rather a person putting himself or herself in such a situation that people can detect him and, 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 and get, a, get a beating for that. Um, Ishfaq Pari, uh, 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 Ashfaq Pari, Ishfaq Pari uh, asked the question, how would Ghazali interpret the hadith al-arwah junood mujannada in terms of the ontological oneness of souls? 
of human souls. So there is a there is a debate. I think Ibn Sina uh, argues that there is a singular soul, and from that singular soul, uh, all other souls uh, derive. Uh, or others might understand that every soul is is unique, um, but it does connect to to the divine. There's something about uh, uh, um, um, sorry, not not necessarily the soul, but the, rather the spirit, the ruh. And that the ruh has a has a central uh, connection. And let's talk about the ruh soul together. So sometimes we have to talk about this as a, as a kind of a, a complex. I in my book I talk about the heart, uh, spirit, soul complex. This network, or you can even include the aql in there. But think about uh, this this subtle tenuous substance in us. Does it have a singular source uh, somewhere? Or is the source, um, you know, differentiated? Uh, you know, do we, uh, is each soul very different from the other, or does it have a central uh, docking station? We don't know. I'll let you know about this truly once I'm not here, and I'll try and send a message um, where where I ended up. Uh, 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 but but but, but uh, some dark humor. But but nevertheless, I think there's been a lot of philosophical what's name and the argument that there's ontological oneness. Um, look, at, at the end of the day, uh, the soul uh, and the spirit is a, is a, 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 a Latifa uh, Rabbaniya, so it has a divine common, whether it is, you see, the difficulty is, if we're going to say it is divine, then it is created or uncreated, that's the problematic. If it's uncreated, then where are we in that picture, then we have something uncreated within us then we become kind of divine in some way. So, so there's been a lot of kind of hesitation to fully explain that and so on. Um, uh, but if it's created, then it's fine. It's God has created so many things and the, and the spirit is created. But I think the spirit is uniquely created um, because what we understand of the afterlife of the spirit, because what, what continues into the afterlife is, is the spirit. And so, um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think most of the questions have been answered. Ibrahim, uh, I think we, we have to yes. end now. Because, yes, uh, yes, yes. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika nashirah la ilaha illa anta nastaghfir kandu. Uh, Iman Omar has a question. Can she hold that question for next week? Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr. Inna al-insan la fi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasubil haqti wa tawasubisam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.